All right, you can turn in your Bible, your King James Bible, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This week we're going to talk about pre-trib rapture scriptures in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, there's this post-trib nonsense, and they say that the pre-trib rapture is a teaching that is foreign to scripture. There's not one verse of scripture that proves it. Oh, it's all throughout the Pauline epistles. You'll see it time and time and time again. Most people don't even look for it. And uh, this has been a very interesting study. I did Romans uh, a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago, I guess now it is, not even sure. But uh, this week I worked on 1 Corinthians and went through, the, read the whole thing, the whole book, and uh, went through and very interesting tie-ins here. But, you know, it's kind of interesting. My wife and I, we were talking about this thing of the this post-trib nonsense where they'll say there is not one verse proving a pre-trib rapture. Not one verse. You know, it's interesting because you can easily debunk that. Because you say, uh, what about John? In the book of Revelation, did John go up before or after the tribulation? You say, well, yeah, but the church... Da, 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 da. Let's stick with the point here for a minute. John, the apostle John, went up. He was caught up into heaven before the tribulation began. Before the Antichrist is unleashed. So even just on that one basic story, there is very clearly a pre-tribulation rapture, at least for John. So for them to say that there's not one mention of a pre-trib rapture anywhere in the King James Bible, instantly you know that they're lying. Very, very interesting. And of course, you know, it's more than just John. John is a type of the church and, and everything else. He's, you know, we've been over that in other studies. But this week we're going to go over... Uh, 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, I'm going to show you time and time and time again that the body of Christ is leaving before this time of Jacob's trouble that's coming. Let's start here in verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we'll get back to that in a minute, who shall, confirm, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You know, we'll start out there with verse 10. I see this in the comments all the time, this ridiculous nonsense. They'll say, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. I forget that there's a term somebody uses, you know, about uh, uh, whatever, you know, I'm a whatever rapturist or something like that. You know, in other words, it doesn't matter what time, it doesn't matter when, pre, mid, post, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, well, then how could that verse be true there, verse 10? How can we all speak the same thing if we're all in disagreement over this thing? And, of course, it affects major doctrine. That's another one of the lies that the post-tribbers will teach. Or people that have no idea what the Bible actually says. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. If you are non-dispensational and you approach the Bible, you are going to come out as a heretic. It's just as simple as that. You need to be dispensational. If you are non-dispensational, you are openly defying God's command in 2 Timothy 2.15 to rightly divide the word of truth. You don't study. You don't rightly divide. You are a rebel against God, if you're even saved. Okay. Dispensational teaching is a Bible requirement. Right? And don't say, well, you know, where's it at in Scripture then? Dispensation does appear in Scripture. It is a Bible word. At least if you have a King James Bible, I know the NIV has taken the word dispensation completely out. So, well, the old ones did. You know, I don't know. They, they keep updating it and stuff to, you know, it's kind of like the shell game, you know, which, which one is the P under? You know, they keep switching it and moving it and switching it and moving it. You know, but it's a Vatican version. What do you expect? But look at this. Look at this, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren. There's urgency there. I am beseeching you, Paul is saying. Please listen to me. 
by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You can only do that if you believe in the time of Jacob's trouble, the, the catching away happening before the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it just came out recently here. I did a little video. Uh, Kent Hovind was on uh, Jeffrey Grider's show, and he openly said, I, I really don't know. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. You know, if, if, if a Christian does the three things there, takes the mark, worships the beast and his image, uh, can they still be saved? The brother asked him that. And Kent Hovind goes, uh, you know, or will they lose their salvation? He says, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I, I think so. I think that they'll, or not, excuse me. Well, can they still be saved is what he asked. And he says, I don't know. I think so. And, you know, I see some of these, some of you post-trib nuts in the comments going, he, had, he was, at least he was honest. He doesn't really know. He's still studying the thing. People, read Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. It's not even a question. There's no, you know, if, if any man worship the, worships the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark, he might, you know, go to hell or he might taste of the wine of the wrath of God and the smoke of their torment might come up forever and ever. It is definite. I mean, read it. I'm not even going to go there. It's an insult to anybody's intelligence to look and say, well, I don't really know what happens if somebody takes the mark. We're not really sure. It could go either way. That's an insult. I mean, common sense. Read plain English. I mean, give me a break. You know? Oh, but, but we should be in the same, you know, we're, we're on the same page in different areas. Hey, if you don't believe in the coming of Jesus Christ happening before the time of Jacob's trouble, we're not in the same mind. We're not in the same judgment. Again, what is the judgment there? I believe that God is going to put me through his judgment and wrath for seven years. Why? Am I not washed in the blood? Have not my sins been paid for on the cross? Why do I have to be purified for seven years? Why do I have to be tested and have to endure to the end to be saved? It doesn't make any sense. You say, well, how about halfway through? No, it's still the problems are still there. You say, well, the wrath doesn't really show up till the end. Of, that, that's another stupid lie of the post-tribbers. You know, again, not going to be nice to you. If you're post-trib, you are believing heresy. If you're truly saved, you'll get out of it. The Holy Spirit will convict you. You'll come out of it so that we can all speak the same thing. You see, Bible-believing Christians need to be all in agreement on this issue. But you say, yeah, but what? It's uh, pre-trib raptures, where is it implied in the, in the text? Thank you for asking. Verse 7, jump up to verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the new world order. Uh, no, waiting for the coming of the Antichrist. No, waiting for the coming of the mark of the beast. No, we're to wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. You say, but yeah, but that could be at the end. It could be, it could be there. We're still having to wait. We still have to go through it. Keep reading. Verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Line it up with Ephesians chapter 1, where we are sealed until the, Holy, until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of promise. Jesus Christ confirms us to the end. We don't confirm ourselves. I don't have to endure to the, to the end of anything to be saved. I'm saved. I'm born again. My sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ and God's Holy Spirit has me sealed until the day of redemption. Do you see the problem that post-trib rapturism creates? That's why the Jesuits, the Catholics are behind it. That's why there's such a push right now. So many people, oh, you, you have to give up on the pre-trib rapture. Give up on the, it's a, the pre-trib fib, all this stuff. Nonsense. Nonsense. I was putting out sermons back in 2009, the post-trib thieves studies, playing these guys and just saying, they're just, they're going and using the same thing. They all have to go to Matthew 24. They all have to be replacement theology. Eventually they all start getting messed up in the gospel. Every single one of them. And I've never been proven wrong on that. Why? I understand how the thing works. It's just insane. We are to look for Jesus Christ. He's the next one that we're going to see. 
And isn't that a comfort to you? I mean, he's the blessed hope. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Isn't it a comfort? I know some of you, you know, you, I've seen it in the comments and stuff. And, and again, I can't reply to every comment in writing because it takes too long. But I can reply to you through my videos. And that is, I see some of you say, you know, I just had one of those wish it was the rapture day days. <laughs> Amen. Amen. There's a lot of days that I have that are like that. There's a lot of days that we have that it's like that. Where you're just like, oh, you know, Lord, how much more do we got to put up with? I mean, it's going to be so nice to get out of here. You're doing what you're supposed to do, if you believe that way. You're waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, so that ye come behind in no gift. What are you supposed to be doing? The things that God has given you, those gifts that He's given you, the gift of salvation, you can give it to other people. It's like you get a big box of chocolates or something like that, and you take one chocolate and you go, hey, that's really great. Would you like to try it? What do I have to do to get it? But let me tell you. And you give them a chocolate, and you give them a chocolate, and you give them, and some people say, get that thing away from me. I don't want that. Okay, I'll go to somebody else. You want a chocolate? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to do. God gives us gifts that we're supposed to use until he says, okay, time's up. Come up hither. And we go, bye-bye world. And they'll be saying, bye-bye, uh, fanatic Christians. I saw again the Pope just came out here December 1st, and he said that uh, fundamentalism is a, a sickness or a disease or something like that that we should fight against. All religions have fundamentalism in them, and, and it's just this terrible thing. <laughs> you know, and it's just like Bible believers are so far beyond the whole fundamental thing. It's just like, <laughs> you know, you look at the fundamentals of the faith, it's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's just the basics of Scripture. I mean, we're, we're so radically over and above the fundamentalists yet, you know, I'm sure the Pope really loves us. That's okay, we feel the same way about him. He's a rotten jerk, too, so, you know. But uh, verse 8, Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Again, how does that work if we go through the time of Jacob's trouble? How are we confirmed unto the end so that we end up blameless? What do you do if you take the mark? <laughs> it's a problem. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God's faithful. What if, what if, what if the preacher of rapture is not true? And what if we actually go into this time? And what if, what, what if, what if, what if, what if? God's faithful. Do you trust Him or don't you? Well, I think I might, but I'm just still afraid. That what if it's not true? What if, what if we do go? What if the Catholics take over? And what if we, you know, well, the Catholics are taking over, by the way. You know, it's, it's amazing. I, I'll say this yet, too. The, the, like when the Pope came here to America, it's like Catholic power kind of ratcheted up another notch. And you say, are you worried about it? Not at all. Not at all. Send them here. I can get to witness to them. What if they kill you? Then I get to go up before you do. Dead in Christ rise first. Then if you if you survive the thing, hey, you come up, you know, you'll be up second, you know. <laughs> I'll be at the head of the line. Well, you know, me and the other dead saints, you know, I'm not worried about it. What in the world? Why? I know my God is faithful. I trust Him. God is faithful. How many of you can say amen to that? And I'm not trying to do some kind of little Catholic, you know, Bible building service there, get people yelling amen or anything. Can't hear you anyhow, so it wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> but, you know, the fact of the matter is, hey, what's, what's really at the root of this whole post-trib movement? They don't believe God's faithful. I saw Ken Hoven recently, you know, I've been watching him, keeping up what's, what's going on there. And I saw him recently and he's like, you know, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff coming and, and we're going to be here for it. And, and you know, there's a, uh, over so many times in the Bible it says, fear not. Kind of hard to do sometimes, but you just have to do it. And I'm go like going, what? <laughs> you know, what's the problem? He doesn't believe God's faithful. We're going to go through it. Some people, you know, and, and you listen, you listen to the post-tribbers. You listen. A lot of them will imply very strongly. They won't come out. 
at least not at first. They won't come out right out and say, you will lose your salvation, but they'll imply it. I'm really worried about these pre-trib rapture believers. I, I just think when the Antichrist shows up, a lot of them are going to lose their faith, and, and I'm just worried about what's going to happen. What is going to happen? You know, Ken Hoven will say, I believe in eternal security, but then he'll turn right around and he'll say, but I'm worried about people when the Antichrist shows up, those that believe in a pre-trib rapture. Why? If I'm eternally secure, if the Lord's confirmed me unto the end, like the text just said there, well, what's the problem? He doesn't think God's faithful. Let's continue. Let's go down to verse 21 here in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. Another good little kick at the post-tribbers. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save, save them that believe. Hello. <laughs> verse 22. Now watch this. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. When are the signs going to come and be more signs than ever seen before? Ironically, many of the things that happen in the book of Revelation, you compare it to what happened with Moses back in the book of Exodus, they're the same thing. Very interesting. Water turning to blood, hailstones falling with you know fire and blood, mingled with fire and blood. A lot of things happening like that. Compare it. It's a very interesting study. But the Jews require a sign. Again, why are Moses and Elijah coming back for Christians? What are they doing over there in the streets of Jerusalem? What, what's the point? You know, I'd look at that and I'd go, okay, and they're over there preaching Jesus. I'd say, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad they're over doing that. I don't need to see Moses and Elijah to confirm anything for me. But the Jews do. The Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem, they need to see Moses and Elijah. Why? Well, right now, it's uh, I look like a fool to a lot of those Jews. A lot of those Jewish rabbis, they go, well, you know, he means well. He's, he knows the Bible fairly well and stuff, and we appreciate him and everything, and he stands up for Israel. We thank the Lord for that. But uh, it's Jesus stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but how's it going to be when Moses and Elijah show up? Oh, boy. And they say, uh, get your Bible out. Probably King James Bible, you know. They'll probably be speaking in Hebrew, but the point is they'll probably say, okay, here's what's going to happen tomorrow in the book of Revelation. The Jews are going to go, huh? What? What? Book of Revelation, Moses, that's the New Testament. And he'll say, yeah, I know that. Oh, and you ought to read the book of Hebrews too. And the book of James. I'll give you some other books that you can read. Oh, the Pauline epistles, well, you know, instruction in righteousness, yeah, but that's not doctrine for us anymore. Mm-hmm, yeah, dispensational change, you see. But you see, those Jews, the word's going to be confirmed to them with signs. Another reason why you know we're not going to be here. Why the body of Christ is not going to be here. But check this out. Check this out. Verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Did you see it? The Jews are requiring a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. If you're a Jew right now and you want to get saved, you know what it is? Jesus Christ died for your sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, He was buried and He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? We'll say, can I see a sign? No! Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. Do you accept or reject? Well, I'd like to see a sign. No signs. I'm sorry. Well, when am I going to get signs? Well, if you're dumb enough to miss the rapture, if you're dumb enough to put off salvation, well, then you're going to get to see plenty of signs. And you're going to get to live through something that's going to make the Nazi Holocaust look like kindergarten. A walk in the park. <laughs> you see it, though? Again, Paul saying, hey, the Jews require a sign. It's going to happen. It's going to come. But we, right now in this dispensation, we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. 
Go over and drop the name Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. It's almost like a stumbling block. You'd be like walking along and all of a sudden, oh, you know, what did you just say? You know, <laughs> if you're Jewish and you're saved, it's a stumbling block to your relatives for you to even drop the name of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Instant fight. But you get the Greeks, Gentiles in other words, and you say about Jesus died for your sins. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's not talk about that. All right, let's change the subject, please. Can we change the subject? You know, let's not talk about that. What is it? Foolishness to them. You see? Very interesting. Another passage that proves that Christians are out of here for the time of Jacob's trouble. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 says here, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Been through this thing many times, but I just mentioned it again there. You say, well, what? What's the significance of this? Um, well, I read over in the book of Matthew chapter 24 that when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Matthew 24 for the Jews. Sorry to all you non-dispensational heretics out there. But you see, in Paul's epistles to Christians, we are God's building. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. There isn't any kind of a holy temple someplace. You see? And you go back to the book of Daniel where it says, you know, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus referring back to the book of Daniel. And it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Written to Jews. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's all for the Jews. Yes, there will be Gentiles that get saved. Don't get me wrong. There are some Gentiles that are very stupid right now, false converts and whatever else, and they're going to miss the rapture. And they're going to have a chance to get saved. Now, if they have pleasure in unrighteousness, if they receive not the love of the truth, God's going to send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's there. But there's going to be Gentiles that will get saved. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 7. But... Rightly dividing Scripture is when you compare Scripture with Scripture. There again, I heard Ken Hovind say in the radio interview thing, he said that, you know, the whole Scripture, it has, to, it has to blend together. It has to come together. No, it does not. No, it absolutely does not. You know? And see, you know, a lot of these people, they go to some Babel building for years and years and years, and they hear the nice little sermons and the evangelistic thing. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that you would see Jesus or that you'd go to heaven if you died, you know, uh, would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I mean, oh, how many of you have been through that thing? I mean, just heard it over and over and over and over, and over again, you know? And these people are coming out of these buildings so anemic they don't know the scriptures. They don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. They're never taught to have that personal relationship with the Lord, to develop that personal relationship. And again, I'll say it one more time. You know, there's so many people that I've heard from and they say, when, when they get out of the Babel building, they go and, they, and it's just like, I'm just going to worship on my own. You'll learn more in two or three weeks than you learned in 30 years at a Babel building. But you get a guy like Ken Hovind and some of these other guys and they're out there, they're doing their ministry thing. You know, and, and it's just like, there's no time to learn. And they count on that Babel building education, which is horrible. But let's continue. Jump to uh, chapter 4 and verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Unless, of course, you go through the time of Jacob's trouble, then there will be some Christians that uh, get kicked out of the body of Christ because they took the mark of the beast and God had to somehow unseal them or perhaps he'll leave them sealed. And, and it, <laughs> You see the problem? You say, well, what does this have to do with the rapture? Think about it. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. What did chapter 1 say? We're to wait for his coming. You see, when he comes... He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. 
There's a lot of people that think that they're saved up here, but their heart is rotten, wicked. You know, you can intellectually think anything, but it's a different matter entirely when it gets down to the heart. Guess what? God's going to judge those secrets. God's going to judge what's really in the heart of man. And I have said it many, many times, and I'm going to say it again, and that is there's going to be a lot of people that go up in the rapture that some people think, oh, huh, you know, what about that? And there's going to be a lot of people that we probably think are going to go up, and they're going to be right here on the earth. Oh, yeah. That's going to be the true test of who's really saved. All the debate over repentance and what level of repentance and easy believism and what does believe mean and what is grace through faith and faith alone and what a the debate's over. If you're saved, up you go. If you're lost, you stay right here on the earth. And then it's going to dawn on you, I was never saved. It's not, well, you know, yes, I'm saved, but... I did have a few sanctification issues or something like that. It, yeah, okay, I'm going to try a little bit better this year. Uh-uh, no, no. When the rapture happens, when the Lord comes for His bride, if you're saved, you go up. If you're lost, you stay down. Very interesting. But again, how can that happen if the body of Christ is in the time of Jacob's trouble? And there are people falling in and out of salvation and stuff, you know? So this guy gets saved and a week later takes the mark of the beast and bam, he's dead. Or God says, well, I guess I'll keep him sealed. And it's, You have to make a mess of the Bible to teach this post-trib nonsense. Turn next in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. It says here, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what does that have to do with the pre-trib rapture? Think about it. Sinners, right now. You take the absolute worst sinner, including a effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, sodomites in other words, the most disgusting, perverted sodomite out there can still get saved. How? You're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You can get saved. Is it going to be that way in the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, there's going to be a lot of uh, good people. All they did was take the mark. Yeah, you know, I worship the beast. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, the guy's just great man of peace and everything else. I mean, he's look what he's done to restore our country and our, our world. And look at all those good things that he's doing. Why wouldn't I worship him? I'm a good person. Yeah, and you're in hell. You might be walking around on the earth, but you're just you're just as good as being in hell. You know, and I've seen some interesting theories people have. They say, well, you know, if the mark's in the forehead, you know, it can mess up the, the pineal gland or whatever there. And, you know, the, they won't even be able to emotionally feel anything about sin or whatever else anymore. I don't know. I think it's going to be a spiritual thing as well, where these people that take the mark are just going to be so devil-possessed They'll kill anybody that tries to be saved. Well, they'll kill them with their bare hands. Kind of a deal. I mean, it's going to be a bad, bad situation. But you see, right now in the church age, even the worst of the worst sinners can still get saved. Not so in the time of Jacob's trouble. There will be people in the time of Jacob's trouble that morally might not be doing these things here in verses 9 through 10. But all they have to do is take that mark, worship the beast, and they're in hell. Promised. Guaranteed in hell. No chance of repentance. How do you reconcile all this? We have to blend the whole Bible together. How? You can't. Absolutely incredible. But look at verse 12. Okay. okay. Again, when you take things from other dispensations, you go back here to the Old Testament, you try to apply it to today. 
And when people are going to take the Pauline epistles and try to apply it into the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to damn people right and left. That's what a lot of these post-tribbers are already doing. They're already saying you have eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't really know for sure if you can take the mark or not take the mark. They're getting people lined up to go to hell. Here's one that they'll use. Look at verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All you got to do is just quote part of that verse. Hey, what do you, what do you mean that you can't take this, this uh, mark of allegiance? I mean, you know, our, our, our ATM cards don't work anymore. I mean, you, you can't use cash anymore. You have to provide for your family. First Timothy chapter 5 says, If any provide not for his own, especially for they of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. God wouldn't want you to be worse than an infidel. And it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, All things are lawful for me. You see, there's nothing wrong with you taking the mark. You see how it's going to work out? You see? Now, if Christians go through tribulation, this time period that's coming, if we go through it, what do you do with that verse? What do you do with it? The body of Christ must leave before the time period can even get started. Now there might be some things, earthquakes in diverse places, we're seeing that. Wars and rumors of wars, we see plenty of that. Famines, pestilences, Sure, absolutely. But the man of sin being revealed? Nope, sorry. The man of sin isn't going to show up until we're gone. We're out of here. And I don't mean, well, he'll show up and, and just kind of, you know, conduct himself in world affairs and no Christian's really going to understand who he is until three and a half years later and all of a sudden he sits himself up in the temple to be worshipped and we all go, I didn't realize he was the Antichrist. Whoa, I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's stupid. Stupid. With a capital S. <laughs> but how about verse 13? Another very interesting thing here. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Okay? It meaning the belly and meats, the them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath raised both, or, and hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Uh, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You see it there again. Which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Again, compare that to Ephesians chapter 1. We are God's purchased possession. Okay? And we are sealed, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. And I've told this story again before, I'll say it one more time, and that is the one time I bought a motorcycle and it was at a dealership in West Virginia. I paid for it online and they put a sold tag on that motorcycle. Now, it didn't matter if some rich multi-billionaire came in there and said, I'm going to give you $500 million for that motorcycle. It did not matter. Why? My name was on it. It was paid in full. And that motorcycle sat there until I came to redeem it. Yes, it was mine. Yes, the paperwork was done. Everything was done. It was all finished. But I had to go down there and travel there to redeem that motorcycle and take it unto myself. That's what we're waiting for. Brother, sister, we are waiting for the redemption of the purchased possession. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> it's going to be great. You say, what does, this have to, what does this passage here have to do with the, uh, as far as a uh, pre-trib rapture is concerned? Well, it's ironic because if you read in Revelation 17 and 18, it talks about Mystery Babylon, with, whom's, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. You can spiritually commit fornication with Mystery Babylon. 
But it's ironic, right now, we are God's purchased possession. But they won't be in the time of Jacob's trouble. So if we commit fornication, yes, it's a very serious sin. Spiritual fornication, joining with the Vatican, using their new versions, you know, or attending their uh, Babel buildings that do things that are have no basis in Scripture but are based upon Catholic traditions. I won't mention any names or anything, but uh, I'll let you figure that out. But the fact is, right now, if you use those things and you're truly saved, well, you're just disobedient. God's going to punish you for that. He will chasten you for it. In the time of Jacob's trouble, different story. Committing fornication with Mystery Babylon in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to land you in hell. Why? The only way to do that, worshiping the beast, where do you worship at? You see? Taking the mark. You see? Comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's how this thing works. Again, another proof that we are not going to be in that time period. Next, go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now, you know, a little interesting little tie in here. Um, we are the bride of Christ. So to avoid fornicating there, to avoid the fornication with Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, what should we do? We should have one husband. And our husband only has one wife. You see how it works? Not polygamy. Monogamy. I think I got that thing right. You know, we have one husband as the bride, and he has one wife. He doesn't look down and say, well, you know, I have my bride there, and also Catholicism, and also Islam, and also... No, uh, no. one way into heaven through Jesus Christ. And we are joined unto him, spiritually speaking. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Again, we see this same thing here that we saw earlier. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. What do you do with that if you believe a Christian goes into the time of Jacob's trouble and the book of 1 Corinthians is still good for doctrine for them? I mean, is it expedient to not be able to, to buy or sell? You know? I mean, couldn't you just take this argument and say, well, you know, it's lawful for me. You know, it's, it's, it is expedient because I can't buy or sell. I can't do anything. I can't give my tithes and offerings to my local church. <laughs> you know, unless I take the mark. You know, a lot of them already have, you know, digital tithing and stuff like this, some of the big ones. You know, you go in there, you thumb scan to get into the place. They got facial recognition technology with all the cameras they have set up. You see? They'll be preaching that text. All things are lawful for me. God wouldn't take it away from you. He wouldn't expect you to not be able to work for a living. And he, You're supposed to have a job to be a productive member of society. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Incredible. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 through 32. Speaking about the communion, the thing of, of remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's a time of self-examination. It's not part of your salvation. You don't have to, you know, have a special little magical cookie and wine and do a chant in Latin or like Dr. Smarty Pants did in our one video. You know, <laughs> you don't have to do that to be saved. And perpetual eating and drinking the blood, eating the flesh, drinking the blood of Jesus Christ to be saved or to stay saved or whatever. Pfft, nonsense. That's Catholic heresy. It actually goes back to ancient Babylon. Or, you know, you can read about it in the book of Jeremiah. They're making cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Still done today. But um, what the purpose of communion is for the body of Christ is a remembrance of what Jesus Christ did. It's a time to judge your sins. Let's read about this. Verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. There's that thing about the Lord's coming again that we're supposed to look forward to. Are you looking forward to it? Verse 27. 
Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay, now that can go two different ways. The first way is somebody that's not saved and is just flippantly, you know, taking communion and just, yeah, whatever. They don't understand the very serious nature of what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for their sins. So they will go damnation to hell. But in context, the real way that you actually would interpret this, you're going to see this as we continue, is eating and drinking damnation to yourself. There are different types of damnation. Okay, A lost person is damned to hell, but a saved person, the wages of sin is death, according to Scripture. That goes for both saved and lost. And if you're messing around in sin and messing around and messing around and messing around and you go and you you don't even, it doesn't really matter, you know, I, I'm not really bothered by my sins and stuff, God can turn your life right now into a living hell. You will suffer the consequences of your sin. He will chasten you. We're going to see that as we continue. Verse 30, For this calls many are weak and sickly among you. See, it applies to saved people. And many sleep. If you continue to mess around in sin, you will get weak, you will get sickly, and God might even have to take you home. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, but your body is going to be sleeping in the ground, waiting for the catching away of the bride of Christ. Verse 31, and here's what communion is about. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Look at 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. All right? Wait a second. If we take the mark of the beast, or if you can take the mark of the beast, uh, wouldn't you be uh, judged with the world? See, again, the, the central biggest argument against this whole post-trib rapture nonsense is what do you do about eternal security? Presents a real problem. Next, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's 5 o'clock, so we're going to get 5 chimes. Again, remember, time is running out. Very important to remember. It's an old clock, you know, and so if I shut the chime thing off, then it ends up, you know, it kind of messes up the order, so I'm going to leave it on. It's going to be background noise for the sermons here. <laughs> but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, lines up with what goes on over in Galatians, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Uh, wait a second. Revelation chapter 7 says 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, sealed and then he sees a great multitude from all kindreds, nations, tongues, people. They're not one body. You see? Time of Jacob's trouble saints are two distinct groups. And they're washing their own robes in the blood of the Lamb. We don't wash our robes. We are washed. Big difference there. Real big difference. We're one spirit with the Lord. And again, it's such a basic understanding of scripture how can jesus christ pour out wrath upon himself duh you know i mean meet saul on the road to damascus and he says saul saul why persecutest thou me he says who art thou lord i'm jesus whom thou persecutest paul never attacked jesus well saul saul never attacked jesus physically who was he attacking christians the body of christ so why on earth, the Lord Jesus Christ up in heaven, he looks down at his body and says, I want to put him through the time of Jacob's trouble. Some are going to be caught out of me, you know, surgery, I guess. You know, some will get ripped out. Oh, sorry, the Holy Spirit of promise didn't apply to you. Sorry about that. You know, I guess I just showing favoritism to some, and I guess some it will, some it won't. Weird. The whole post-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, you know, Bugs Bunny, Donald Duck, uh, Mickey Mouse, Tooth Fairy system is nonsense. 
you got to be nuts to believe it. Again, you know, there are no clear scriptures. Man, there are clear scriptures all throughout here. I mean, this is the first time I did this study, you know, going through the book of Romans. I mean, it's just like all through the book of Romans. The book of 1 Corinthians, all through the book of 1 Corinthians. The theme repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. It's impossible for the body of Christ to go through it. But some of you still wonder, what if? What if we can't trust God? What if? What if? What if? That's a problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 8. I thought this is interesting too. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? You say, what does that have to do with the pre-trib rapture? Well, let's think about this. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10? My sheep hear my voice, and I call them by name, and lead them out. They don't know the voice of strangers. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 15, which we're going to be looking at here in a minute? Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The trump shall sound. The trump of God shall sound. What did John hear in Revelation chapter 4? A voice, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. Hmm. So, the trumpet doesn't give an uncertain sound. It calls you by name. There's no doubt. When it happens, it's going to be, you talk about weird you talk about giving you goosebumps that are going to last for a long time. I mean, all of a sudden, it's just going to be like, you're going to hear this voice. It's going to sound like a trumpet, and it's going to call your name, and it's going to say, come up hither. And it's just going to be like, oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, whatever you're doing, you're done. Whoop, up you go. And again, that's why it's a purifying hope. You want to keep that in mind if you're tempted to sin, because it could happen at any time in spite of what the post-tribbers think. But it's interesting. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? What happens at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble with us in heaven? We prepare for battle. Revelation chapter 19. We get married, and the Lord, as a nice treat for his wife, he says, all right, honey, mount up, get on the horse, Body of Christ gets on the horses, and the Lord says, All right, let's get back down to the earth. I'm going to show off for you. Goes down, 200 million man army down there. Battle of Armageddon. The Lord says, You want to see this? Watch this. One man versus 200 million. You talk about a superman, <laughs> you know? You talk about a real man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gets down there and he goes, All right. And he doesn't even go down and beat him up with his hands. He just goes and opens his mouth and he speaks. And whoo, dead. And then we ride down through it. You know, the triumphal march to Jerusalem. And then when we're down there, I believe when we are down there on the earth, that's when we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the reception. So we have the marriage in heaven. We prepare for battle. We go down. We go through the battle. And then we go to Jerusalem for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lord brings all the people that are left to judgment, judgment of the nations, Matthew chapter 25. And then after that, I think that's probably going to be where the marriage supper of the Lamb happens as He restores the earth, and it's, it's going to be amazing. Absolutely amazing. A lot of fun. But let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Very true. You know what separates Jesus Christ from all the other leaders of all the other religions? I'll be nice for a minute. You know what separates him? He didn't stay dead. You know what uh, Muhammad is? Maggot food. He's a fertilizer. There's probably some nice flowers growing on the above his grave. 
you know. Um, you know what Buddha is? The same. Put him to bed with a shovel. And he hasn't come out since then. You know what every pope is? Dirt. Dead. They aren't coming back up. You know what all these Catholic saints, I've been looking into this thing, you know, they got these Catholic saints, you know, these like mummified Catholic saints, a uh, uh, dead corpse in a cathedral and things. Disgusting. Hey, children, let's go see this Saint so-and-so. They're, you know, Saint Stinky here, you know, <laughs> dead corpse laying there. Incredible. And they call it, it's uncorruptible Saint so-and-so. <laughs> uncorruptible because you pump them full of chemicals. Because you're still practicing the same ancient Egyptian embalming techniques that pagans have done down through the centuries. That's why they're uncorruptible. You know, half of them, they got wax faces and stuff like this. It's like uncorruptible. Give me a break. <laughs> we become incorruptible at the rapture, not before. Any truly saved Christian would know that. But you see, I want to cover this very important thing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Because another one of the things that I heard Ken Hovind say, and a lot of the post tribbers will say this, when Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery in verse 51 of the same chapter, they'll say, well, see, the mystery that Paul is showing is they didn't understand when are the dead coming up because Jesus didn't talk about when the dead come up. He left that out. He didn't give all the details. So Paul is giving further details about this you know, after the tribulation thing in Matthew 24. Because you see, one's in the field, one's taking the other left, two men are grinding, or two women grinding at the mill, one's taking the other's left, you know, and they say, well, where did the dead come up? And you know, that's a good argument against this whole rapture versus what goes on in the Gospels, because there's no mention of dead saints coming up. But see, then they'll, they'll take it, and they'll twist it, and they'll say, well, there's no mention because Jesus never talked about it, but now... Paul reveals it. Let me show you that that's not true. Jesus never talked about when the dead saints are going to come up. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 10. Verse 6. It says here, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. That's why John sees a door open in heaven. Then he gets called up, hears a voice like a trumpet, and gets called up. Verse 8, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Reference to going in before the time of Jacob's trouble, coming out after the time of Jacob's trouble, and finding what? Pasture. You know what the Bible says is going to happen at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble? All the mountains are going to be laid flat. And you study what happens in the Millennial Kingdom. I'm going to be coming out with a study on that, what we can expect in the Millennial Kingdom, what we should be looking forward to, why we should suffer in this life, you know? And it's farming. Farming is going to take on a whole new level. You talk about organic farming, buddy. It's going to be incredible organic farming. We're not even going to have to worry about the wild animals. They're going to be our friends in, the time, in, that, in that millennial kingdom. It's going to be incredible. Absolutely incredible. So we go in before the time of Jacob's trouble. We come out after the time of Jacob's trouble. And what do we find? We find pasture. Pretty incredible. Uh, verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to kill, or but for, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, which all post rivers do. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. You say, wait a second there. Uh, where was the thing of... Uh, the dead coming up. Well, look at it. I, <coughs> excuse me. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. You say, well, yeah, but that just means for living people. Okay, go to chapter eleven. And I talked about this in the Romans study. John chapter eleven, verse twenty-five. Jesus said unto her, "I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were." dead, 
yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly, come up hither, and she rose quickly and came unto him. And it's ironic because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ. But John leaves it out. You can't compare Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and 21 to anything in John. Why? Because there's a different system there. John is a type of the church. Jesus is dealing differently with John. So when post rivers come out and they say, well, the mystery that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, it's a reference to the fact that Jesus never talked about when the dead saints are resurrected. You know they're lying to you. He did talk about it. But it's only recorded in the book of John. You know why? Because it's a different event than what's going on in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and Luke 21. It's a different event. Now let's go to verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Isn't it weird that there's all this talk about Trump, Donald Trump? Wouldn't it be strange if the Lord's kind of playing a little bit of a joke there? Maybe he'll be elected or maybe there'll be some kind of a thing with him. I don't know. I know the Lord has a weird sense of humor. You know, we get to see it a lot. <laughs> and I'm saying that reverently, okay? The Lord likes to work things out. He has a weird sense of humor, let me tell you. Verse 53 for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory? Uh, no, actually, that's not the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ because you see a lot of Christians, unfortunately, believe the pre-trib lie. And when the Antichrist showed up, they took the mark of the beast and they were lost. Isn't that terrible? Saved for 50 years and the Antichrist showed up and they took the mark of the beast by mistake and God had to send them to hell. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I know it says earlier there that God will confirm them, confirm them until the end and that they're his purchased possession and everything. But... We got to make the whole Bible teach the same thing. So I'm sorry. It, it just did. A bunch of nonsense is what post trib rapturism is. Verse 58. Therefore, my brethren, beloved, or my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. You're going to back down. There's less and less people that are pre-trib. You're going to back down. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> I don't think so. There are so many clear scriptures that prove a pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. Pre-trib rapture, if you want to say the incorrect term. There's so many scriptures. I ain't moving one inch. Not going to happen. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what you do when you're expecting Jesus Christ to come back. Those gifts that he's given you, you're going to use them to get people saved. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know it would be in vain to serve the Lord Jesus Christ if we were going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble and you could risk losing it all? What a gamble. You know, serving the Lord, passing out all these tracts, witnessing the people, you know, doing what you can, praying, reading your Bible, fasting and praying, giving to ministries, doing this, doing that, all this stuff. Boom! Antichrist shows up. 
what am I going to do now? I got to buy. Uh, what am I going to do? You take the mark. Your labor was in vain. But not if you believe that the rapture happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. Your labor is not in vain. Listen to me. It's very important. You cannot waste your time reading the Bible. I had somebody asked me that question, actually. They said, is it possible to read your Bible too much? I said, well, in one way, and that is if you're reading your Bible all the time and not living it. If you're reading about how to get people saved and how to witness to your friends and family and relatives and whatever, and you aren't going out and doing it. That's the only way that it would be a sin to read the Bible too much. But when you go out and you put out gospel tracts, when you go out, and, and I don't even say, you know, just going out and putting out gospel tracts. The Lord will work you up to the point where you're able to witness to people and have conversations with people. Again, spending time in the comments section and dealing with the weirdos that come to this channel, <laughs> good night. It'll teach you how to get into conversations with people, how to, how to answer them from the Word of God. You're not wasting your time. Whatever you do for the Lord, your labor is not in vain when you are pre-trib. Post-trib, your labor is in vain. You better get out there and start building a survivalist retreat. Buy 600 acres in Alabama and start building that survivalist retreat because you've got to endure to the end. <laughs> yeah. Finally, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Read down through to the end. Verse 24, the churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Kind of interesting. It's almost a prophetic thing that at the end of the church age, people are going to be meeting in their homes, church in their house. Verse 20, all the brethren greet you, greet ye one another with an holy kiss. All the brethren greet you. What's it going to be like when we have the rapture happen? All the brethren are going to be greeted by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's going to be great. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Get ready. Get ready for this one. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. You know what anathema maranatha means? Anathema. The Catholics will use this. They'll, they, you know, they, they counterfeit. They're Satanists, so they counterfeit what Jesus Christ does. Anathema means cursed or damned. You know what maranatha means? At his coming. If you don't love Jesus Christ, you are going to be damned at his coming. You say, I thought you said that there's a chance that people are going to have an opportunity to get saved. Well, if you know about him right now, the Bible says God will send you strong delusion. Why? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Well, I don't know if I'm ready to get saved yet. I just, you know, there, there's still some things I'm trying to work out. Whatever you are doing, drop it and get on your knees and get saved. Listen to me. Not one thing is worth you going into this time period. And when we leave, there ain't going to be no second chance to go up. When God's sheep leave, when the bride of Christ goes up, your chance to escape the worst time period on earth in the history of man, that chance is over. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to be damned at His coming. Anathema Maranatha. And notice how Paul writes it. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema Maranatha. You know, maybe that's the, the reaction we need to have to people. Lost relatives, lost friends, lost co-workers, lost whatever. Are you saved? Hey, don't tell me about it. You need to get saved. Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. He loved you enough to die for your sins. Shut up. Get away from me. Anathema, Maranatha. They look at you and they go, what? What does that mean? You know, it means you're going to be damned at His coming. I warned you. 
Let him be anathema maranatha. Bye-bye. Oh, but we should just sit around and argue with them and stuff like this and let them tear us down. No, no, no. There's so much proof of the Bible out there right now. Nobody has any excuse. Nobody has any excuse in the world. Something to think about. Verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I do love you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I do. And if you don't know that, it's because you got problems. <laughs> okay? You think when I'm harsh and mean and rude and crude and all that other stuff, you think that's not love. That's love. All right? I don't warn about things that are not a big deal. Right? Yeah, there are liberty issues. Yes, I understand all that. We're not going to get into all that stuff. But the fact of the matter is, I want to see people saved. And if you have been led into this post-trib lie, you need to get away from it quickly. You need to put your faith in what God promised. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for uh, having me to do this study. And I thank you for what all you've shown me. And I thank you for the comments that we get on the videos where I see you working in other people's lives. You've been convicting uh, all of us, Lord, uh, on these different issues and, and just to be able to come together and, and to have that fellowship of the Spirit where we can all understand that we're thinking the same things, Lord. I thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray that, that uh, we wouldn't get dogged down and bogged down by the post-tribbers out there, but we would just be diligent about doing your work and warning people about what's coming and uh, that we would uh, be ready when you take us out of here. And I pray that that day would come very soon, Lord. Uh, I'm very anxious to see you and to see all my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be it. <laughs> Next one's going to be 2 Corinthians. Uh, this is, a, I think, probably the most enjoyable study I've ever done. Um, just going through the Bible and seeing uh, things that point to the catching away being before the time of Jacob's trouble. It's fascinating. And you know something I want to just say is something that kind of occurred to me. I was outside doing some work today and, and uh, you know, I thought to myself, what is the final book in the Bible? The book of Revelation. Well, Revelation is a very interesting word because you see it's something, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sure, when he comes. But there's another aspect to that word. Revelation is a progressive word. As we get closer to the Lord returning, more things are being revealed. Time is revealing more and more and more. It's incredible. And I think that there are things, you know, there's stuff in the book of Revelation I read years ago and I thought to myself, man, I don't see how that could even happen. Now it's just like, yeah, I can understand that. Yep, I could see that happening. You know, you read the thing that God drops a third of the people and stuff and you go, man, is it really going to be that bad? Yeah, I can see it now. You know, so many things are being revealed. It's only going to become clearer as time goes by. So that is why we stick by the book. Don't let anybody shake your faith. We are going to be leaving soon.